Thank you very much, and also I'd like to extend my thanks, or add my thanks, to the many thank yous which have been extended already today and also yesterday. I'm having a wonderful time, and I was very pleased to be invited um, to speak at the conference. Thank you, too, to Mr. and Mrs. Lund for hosting it. Um, sorry, just a technical moment here. Um, where is it gone? Um, oh, there. <laughs> And then it's If you can't hear me, shout at me immediately because I know my voice can fade. In May 1893, the Westminster Gazette published an interview with Whistler that had been conducted in his Paris studio. The interview was unsigned but it appears in a book of press cuttings by the journalist Robert Harborough Sherout, now in the collection of the University of Reading. The interview is interesting because it touches on a range of topics and some unexpected names come up. I will look at some of these in my paper today. Sherard arrived unannounced at the studio, which was situated on the top floor of a six-floor purpose-built modern building in Montparnasse. The two men had not previously met, and Sherard caught Whistler off guard, so the interview is less well rehearsed than some of Whistler's other performances. Sherard provided his readers with a pretty full account of the, what, the spacious, carefully arranged interior. His description of the angles, doors, and passages, as he described them, add to what we know from contemporary photographs and a brief account in the panel's biography and to that, I should also add that wonderful photograph which we saw yesterday in John Seward's talk. And this is one of the contemporary photographs. There was a large wood-burning fire just seen in this photograph and a tiled kitchen with a French range, which Whistler told Sherard was for cooking déjeuner. A white ladder seen to the left in the photograph here led to what Sherard described as a mysterious little white door and halfway along the gallery was another flight of steps, also in white wood. Through the full-length windows that ran across the front of the building was a large terrace with trellises and Venetian blinds. A heated hothouse stood at one end of the terrace. There were plans to grow flowers and grapes. And I imagine that's the terrace which you see just glimpsed at the top of the building. The furniture is varied and beautiful, Sherard reported. There against the wall are three white wood boxes of decreasing size on top of one another. Here are couches and screens, and all about the room, a plentiful supply of chairs in white wood with green decorations. Whistler told Sherard he planned to cover them in a tapestry that would harmonize with the flesh-colored walls in green draperies. Sherard clearly appreciated the heady mixture of the visual and the sensual on offer in this perfumed environment. His description of the colors, textures, and scented flowers remind me of Basil Howard's studio in Oscar Wilde's The Portrait of Dorian Gray. Sherard was a long-standing friend of Wilde and knew the book well. Whistler's studio was a beautiful, ascetic space. Sorry. Um, oh dear, sorry, I've done it. Oh. <laughs> what, what is... Sorry, I'm, I'm getting mixed up already, too. Sorry. Um, <laughs> Whistler's studio was a beautiful and ascetic space, but it is locked in time, and even with the photographs, the descriptions, and the existing fabric of the building, we cannot recreate the living in experience of Whistler and the international mix of visitors who went there. How do we map out those visits and get any sense of the people who gathered there? The online correspondence gives an idea of some of them. In May 1893, the same month that Sherard was there, various dealers tried without success to visit. But there is no mention in the correspondence of the visit that the di critic D.S. McCall and Joseph Pennell made um, in that month. 
and in fact it's a letter from a call to a sister which provides that information. Oh, sorry. It's back to front. I'm sorry, in England they go the other way. But anyway, a tiny sketch here, which you see on the back of some notes which Whistler made, is inscribed a sketch of Toulouse Lautrec entering Whistler's, Whistler's studio. And this is, in fact, the only evidence that Toulouse Lautrec was a visitor in Paris. Does the sketch form part of an interesting trajectory that includes another recorded meeting in London and Lautrec's love of ascetic furniture and Liberty fabrics? bought for the redecoration of his Paris apartment. And it's this scheme which Lautrec introduced in Paris in the early 1890s, which sparked the vogue for the English ascetic style amongst his circle. What exactly did um, Whistler do with all that space in the largest studio he ever had? There was little evidence of any painting going on there and indeed, his time was largely devoted to printmaking. Hidden behind a screen was a printing press and a table with the necessary paraphernalia for etching, which you see in the photograph reproduced in the panel biography. Visitors reported that the canvases were turned to the wall. No easel visible, not one palette, none of the charming litter of the art, observed Sherard. By all accounts, the studio was an underused workspace. Are those brushes wet or dry? McCall asked Whistler when he answered the door, holding a bunch in his hand. They were dry, of course. Why was all that space and those elaborate domestic arrangements necessary? The studio was close enough to Whistler's residence on the Rue de Bac for Whistler and his wife Beatrice to entertain at home, and entertain they did. I think there may have been other reasons for needing a studio and choosing this location. Location, Whistler told Sherard, was everything. I only found it after a long hunt, and I am really pleased with it. The studio was situated on, at 86 Notre Dame des Champs, which is, runs a street away from the south entrance of the Luxembourg Gardens, very, therefore very close to the Luxembourg Museum. And it was, in fact, on that street, just at the, at the edge on the left, which you can see Deschamps. Well, that's more or less where Whistler's studio was situated and still is. The building still stands. So very close to the entrance of the gardens, which you can see is this green space here. The Luxembourg Museum, which was situated at the end, other end of this garden, um, acquired arrangement in grey and black, the painting of the mother at the end of 1891 with the enthusiastic support of Marlamé and some of the leading critics in the Paris art world. Living where he did, Whistler was a short walk from his treasured painting. Just think, to go and look at one's own picture hanging on the walls of the Luxembourg, Whistler wrote to his brother. Whistler had watched the painting of the mother slip out of his hands during his years of financial insecurity, but refused to sell it and hung on to his dream of getting it back which he finally did in 1888. He took a momentous decision when selling it to the French state 20 years after he had painted it. The geographical proximity of his studio and the museum was important to him. I'm sure of it. And I'm suggesting that the studio must have functioned as a psychic holding space for the near presence of Whistler's treasured and totemic picture, as well as being a showcase of domestic harmony made ready for the haunting absence of his mother. Whistler was keen to tell Sherard about the position of his picture in the museum. The painting of the mother hung in room six, opposite Sergeant's La Carmencita, and in the same room as Manet's Olympia. What would Whistler's mother thought about keeping company <laughs> with a Spanish dancer and a prostitute with big ambition? <laughs> It's hard to say, isn't it? But she has turned her back. What did Whistler think? <laughs> Whistler thought that the sergeant was a fine picture, but there are perhaps manets that I like better, he told Sherard. Well, what I'm going to try to do now is connect five lithographs with a secure date of 1893 and 1894. 
which mark out Whistler's path through the verdant 17th century Luxembourg gardens that border the museum. And nursemaids and their chargers populate all of these prints. I'm going to run through the first of these quite quickly. But first of all, I want to show you a painting by Tallow, as you can see, done in 1883, um, juxtaposed with a contemporary photograph, which shows um, a very important site for these lithographs, um, as we can see here um, in the first lithograph, which um, is, in fact, a view of the steps, which you see both in the painting and also in the photograph. A young child trails behind a female figure up the steep steps of the sunken terrace at the center of the gardens. The elaborate urn held up by dancing figures in Tallow's picture can be identified on the right. Another young child is dwarfed by the group of men in soft hats gazing with interest at the entwined female figures on the urn, while other clusters of disparate individuals, some in top hats, stand adrift at the top of the steps. A nurse and another woman, perhaps a governess, chat together while children cluster around a statue, which as far as I can ascertain is that of Mary Stuart, one of a number of statues of celebrated French queens sighted on the terrace. Mary Stuart, of course, was also Queen of Scotland and perhaps is included here as a fitting tribute to Whistler's beloved Scottish wife, Beatrice. A solitary young child, back turned, peers through the balustrade, ignored by the nursemaids who stand on the left. Did the nearby proximity of the painting of his mother bring back memories of his childhood as Whistler drew the nursemaids and their charges? If so, there is little evidence of any happy families in these images. Indeed, there are no families, meaning a nuclear family of father, mother, and two children. What a spectacle of discipline and punish in the terrace Luxembourg. Three nursemaids sit barricaded behind three chairs, placed at right angles to them. A young girl with her head down, hands clasped, with one foot partly off the ground, the other raised in the air, waits to escape from this oppressive arrangement. Another nursemaid, wearing an identical hat to the first, stands arms crossed and appears to scold the young child looking up at her. Whistler made another lithograph of the Luxembourg Gardens, which I'm going to look at in detail in a moment. But as you can, and in fact it's here, but first of all I want to look at it um, with this Gauguin zincograph. Gauguin is in fact, I think, probably the least, ex un least expected among the artists that Whistler mentioned to Sherard, and I'm only touching on a few here. The two artists probably met in Dieppe in 1885, where they both spent part of the summer. And it may be that Gauguin listened to Whistler give an abridged version of Mr. Whistler's 10 o'clock at the Sickert's rented house there. Degas was also present. Whistler told Sherard that he had seen Gauguin's pictures at Goupil's in Paris. This would have been in 1888. And he probably saw the 1889 Volpini show in the summer of 1889 in Paris when Gauguin showed um, uh, Zincograph prints, including this one, which form part of the Volpini suite. Zincographs are, as you probably know, lithographs made on zinc plates rather than the traditional stone. In 1894, Whistler thought of working on a zinc plate, telling Thomas Way that the artists here are using them. And interestingly, Joseph Pennell, who became close to Whistler in 1893, acquired an impression of a Gauguin zincograph around this time. Whistler also would have seen the Gauguin wood sculpture that Marlame displayed in his small apartment on the Rue de Rome, where Whistler was a frequent visitor. Whistler, of course, dismissed Gauguin, always a sign that he was interested, suggesting that he thought he was dead. He would have, wouldn't he? But I think that it's worth thinking about the connections between the two for a moment, partly because both came to the attention of the Paris symbolists in the late 1880s and early 1890s. Both artists regarded the visual effect of line and color as the primary expressive means for an artist, meaning in the case of Whistler, an advanced version of art for art's sake, or 
what is sometimes referred to as pictorial symbolism in the case of Gauguin. Either way, we can take this to mean they regarded the work of art as primarily a flat surface arranged with line and color, or at least they did by the 1880s and 1890s. I'm absolutely with Caroline and what she said yesterday about the nocturnes. Well, I'm talking about prints today in my paper, but the definition still applies, even though it is to do with the way line makes its own pattern across the surface of the paper. There are big differences between the scale, the figures, and the subject matter in Whistler's Nursemaids and Gauguin's Zinkograph, but there are similarities too. Each distinct group of figures floats in empty space and defies a naturalistic reading in spite of the close connection with a particular Paris topography in the case of Whistler or the Marquesan landscape in the case of Gauguin. I don't want my comparison between Whistler and Gauguin to end up with an argument about influence, but if we are going to put Whistler's asceticism in an international arena, we have to square them up against some of its principal gladiators. And I'm showing you these um, two images, a rather uh, poorly, um, a, a, a rather bad image, rather, of the sergeant and also um, a contemporary photograph of the sunken gardens, which you see in the Whistler um, lithograph, simply to show you how much detail Whistler actually eliminated from these prints. Although they do seem to be filled with topographical detail, there is also, too, a lot of empty space. And some of it, of course, has to do with the actual terrain, as you can see um, very clearly when looking at the sergeant. But it is telling, I think, that he doesn't include the pool at the center of the sunken gardens. And in the nursemaids, um, in particular, it's, it's the, the print it is emptied of these details. So, a single, so single figures and separate groups float in the empty what I would call no space, um, because it can't be flat space, it has to be no space, which is encircled by a more determined topographical detail. A young girl with spindly legs, which stand, she's standing in the middle there, straddled far apart, stands alone. A toddler takes a few steps held by its nursemaid. A cluster of nursemaids sit with their charges. Another nursemaid holds a young child Two, two young children play. Their half-finished forms float in the space that separates each of these figures and the groups of figures. And all of this denies the possibility of a continuous narrative about an everyday event in the Luxembourg Gardens. The other figure who comes up in Whistler's, and I'm in a sense going off on a tangent here, but it will come back to what I looking, was looking at a moment ago. The other person who comes up a lot in this interview is Marlamé. We know, of course, that Whistler and Marlamé had a close friendship. That's been well established. And looking at their correspondence, we can see that it plays out a narrative of their mutual admiration, their meetings, and tremendous rapport. So it's hardly surprising that Marlamé comes up in the way that he does in Whistler's conversation with Sherard. But what Whistler said is quite different from the tenor of his letters to Marlamé, which are much more full of chat about planned meetings and work in progress. Whistler told Sherard how it delighted him to hear Whistler Marlamé speak as he speaks at his weekly receptions in the Rue de Rome, clear and limpid, with occasional hesitations, and then such phrases. The pauses in Marlamé's elliptical speech were spaces of silence that disrupted the narrative and destroyed any lingering tangential realism. In very prose, Marlamé's silence is visualized by the white spaces that separate the short and longer paragraphs. And here I must apologize on behalf of the British Library. I ordered a copy of the book so that I could make a scan from it over two weeks ago, and it's still in transit, I think in a cart drawn by a pony, um, <laughs> coming down from York to London. 
So unfortunately, I do not have an image to show you, but essentially what it is is this uh, irregular spacing between the paragraphs and the text so that the actual white spaces in the text are as important to the visual effect um, as the text itself. Roger Pearson suggests these white spaces encircle the text with silence. Whistler's lithographic portrait of Marleme was used as a frontispiece for the 1893 edition and while Whistler was not a great reader, he must have been intrigued by the visual representation of silence encoded in the text, which illuminates what Roger Pearson calls the fold of dark lace of the printed words. Commenting on the drawn marks of one of Whistler's lithographs, one of the songs on stone, as Whistler entitled it, Marlamé wrote, I hear your voice in it. The same voice is clearly heard in the white spaces in Whistler's The Nursemaids. The young girl who stands alone is engulfed by empty space. She is a more schematically drawn cousin of the fantastical children in Steer's Walberswick seascapes. Steer belonged to the Whistler secret cohort, and we know that Whistler was very aware of what Steer was doing because he um, complained about one of these seascapes which he had to autumn exhibition of the Walker Art Gallery. She is a performer, this young girl in the center, on an empty kind of stage where no real, no real narrative um, is taking place. And she shares her lineage with the young girls who play in Steer's fantasy seascapes. But she also hovers closer to the banal and everyday, not an individual or even an individual type, her corporality dissolves into a cut-out shape, like the carefully manicured box in the Luxembourg Gardens. It's a haunting hieroglyphic of the enduring moment of childhood that transcends the material presence of the young girl. The Nursemaids was a number of lithographs Whistler made for distribution in the periodical press. He worked on the idea of making a lithograph for the art journal on and off for two years before it was finally tipped into the December 1894 issue. It probably goes without saying that the Luxembourg Gardens were and remain a tourist destination in Paris. But who focused on the nursemaids and children who populated the gardens before Whistler? We are also attended Marlamé's Tuesday evenings. He certainly met Whistler there. And he took up this theme in the summer of 1894, just when Whistler was working on the nursemaids. The subject, as you can see, is part of this very decorative, very beautiful screen, um, some of which I show you here. Thanks to PowerPoint, I can put it back together because it's not in the same museum location these days. But, um, you can see that, that Vuillard has taken up this theme um, in these decorative panels, a private commission for Taddy Natterson. The subject, in a sense, the subject of Whistler's lithographs is writ large in the panels that make up the public gardens. But as I said, it was a privately commissioned decorative scheme. In term, terms of scale, Vuillard's project wins hands down, but nevertheless, I cannot help but think that there is more than a whiff of a connection between Whistler's lithographs, Whistler's subject, and We Are's exploration of this theme. And that, to me, seems to be one of the problems with Whistler's late work, is that it's often on a very small scale, or it's, in a sense, um, something which seems more ephemeral. And therefore, we can't make this, or haven't made the same kinds of connections that we would have done if we were looking at paintings and we were looking at large-scale work. And it's this theme of childhood which I now want to return to um, in the last part of the paper. Henry James writes about the connection between childhood and an enduring quantity of time, as he calls it, in The Ambassadors, a novel where the sculptor Gloriani and also, I suggest, the New Englander Lambert Strether are based on Whistler in part. Quite possibly, James had Whistler's The Nursemaids in mind when writing about the Luxembourg Gardens and the novel. It would not be the first time that James used a work of art by Whistler as inspiration, 
for one of his um, word pictures of a um, topographical scene or an urban scene. When Strether finds his way to the Luxembourg Gardens soon after his arrival in Paris, sitting on a pretty, ja pretty chair, James tells us, us, he is caught by a charming and pleasing image of terraces, alleys, vistas, fountains, little trees in green tubs, little women in white caps, and shrill little girls at play, all sunnily composed together. During the hour that Strether sits there, James tells us that the cup of his impressions seemed to truly overflow. On a later visit to the Luxem his Luxembourg nook, Strether has an epiphany. The sight of the children played, made him think of things in a strange, vast order, swinging at moments off into space, into past and future, and then dropping fast with some loss of breath, but with a soft, reassuring thud down to yesterday and today. The children who play in the nursemaids are the visualization of James' idea of an enduring quantity of time into past and future and down to yesterday and today. The 19th century children who played in the Luxembourg Gardens are long dead, but the children who continue to play there today form one long continuum of color, sound, and movement from yesterday to today and into the future. It's a little bit of ordinary life, perhaps too ordinary and normal, when weighed up against Gauguin's vast colonial project, but enough to fill a life. And here I'm quoting Sartre in the Age of Reason, who also goes to Luxembourg Gardens and watches those children and nursemaids play. Is it absurd to su suggest an affinity between Gauguin's large project to seek out the core of human significance by moving to the so-called primitive South Seas and Whistler's representations of enduring childhood? Are there links between these representations of the exotic and their, order and their ordinary and their visualization? At a moment when international historicism or historicist internationalism um, is becoming universal. That's not very nicely put, but that's what I am trying to say. I don't know that that's a question that one can answer, but I do think that Whistler belongs in this arena and if asked to choose, I'll take Whistler's children over Gauguin's representation of his naked 13-year-old wife any day. Thank you. <laughs>